Exercise S39 Identifying Important Points in a Conversation Now listen to a conversation between two students. The tickets for the best seats in the concert hall cost $60. Oh, that's much more than I meant to pay. Don't we get a student discount for these kinds of functions? Not for a concert like this. Look, the least expensive ones are $15. Where are the $15 seats located? In the top balcony. That's too far away. We wouldn't be able to see anything on the stage. The middle balcony costs $40. Well, the $40 seats are still expensive, but I guess if we really want to enjoy the concert, we'd better get them. What do you think? I'm not sure. Exercise S40 Analyzing the task that relates to the conversation. The students are discussing the possible choices in a decision they must make. State their problem. Then explain which decision you prefer and why. Exercise S43 Identifying important points in a lecture. Now listen to part of a lecture in a cultural geography class. The problem of aging is taking on new dimensions in many countries. The societies that are faced with this problem are the ones with a large aging population and a low birth rate. They're finding that Social Security expenditure has become an excessive percentage of the national income. People are living longer and therefore are getting benefits for a longer period of time. The aging populations need more medical attention at a time when those costs are skyrocketing. Furthermore, many elderly people can no longer look after themselves and need to be cared for. Frequently, neither they nor their families can pay for this intensive care. Thus, the financial burden falls on the state. Those countries where the problems associated with an aging population are most acute are actively seeking long-term solutions. Exercise S44 Analyzing the task that relates to the lecture Using points and examples from the lecture Explain how the population age distribution is contributing to financial problems for governments. Exercise S48 Responding to the Integrated Listening Speaking Tasks 1. Listen to a conversation between two students. Have you signed up for the GRE test yet? Yeah. Have to if I want to get into graduate school. You sound upset. I am. I don't understand why we've got to take that test. I mean, the university can tell whether we're up to graduate work by looking at our grade point average and letters of recommendations. You're just suffering from test anxiety. Yeah, I am. Don't you know those tests are gender biased? Did you know that the average mean scores for women are about 60 points lower than men's on standardized tests, whereas women's grade point averages are higher? Really? No, I didn't know that. So, uh, what's the deal? Well, test anxiety may count. Women tend to suffer anxiety levels that negatively affect their scores. You know, there was a study not long ago in which a control group and an experimental group both with an equal number of men and women, were given a standardized test. The people in the control group were just given the test, and those in the experimental group were told that the researchers were looking at gender differences. The women in the experimental group scored even lower than the women in the control group. And they think the women in the experimental group were more anxious? Well, that's probably a part of it. But other studies show that men and women approach the tasks differently. So what do we, us guys, do differently? Uh, for one thing, you guys take risks. We're more cautious and try to analyze the items and check our answers. 
so we work slower, and that's a disadvantage on a timed test. I can see that. What else? Men seem to enjoy trick questions, whereas women find them distracting. Well, I guess I can understand your feelings, but don't you think a university takes these differences into account? I'd hope so. You know, it isn't just women, but ethnic groups and even non-native English speakers have been shown to do better on open-ended tasks like essay tests. The students discuss the problem with standardized testing. Describe the woman's concerns. Then state what you think of the woman's concerns and explain why. Two. Listen to a conversation between two students. Hey, Becky. You look kind of uh down. Yeah. I just discovered that I can't sign up for research methodology because I didn't take the prerequisite research writing skills. Can you believe that research methodology is only offered in the fall term? So if I can't take it next fall, it'll be another year before I can take it. I see you have a summer catalog. Is it being offered this summer? Yeah. But I really need to go home and work this summer. Summer courses aren't so bad. <laughs> I kind of prefer them. They're so intensive that they're over before you know it. Have you ever done a summer term? No, but I'll have to this summer if I'm going to graduate in time. Did you know that course is offered as an internet course? You could go home, hold down a job, and study online after you get off work. Really? No, I didn't know that. You've signed up for online courses, right? Yeah, once. In fact, it was the research writing skills course. How was it? I failed. What? But how is that possible? You're the one that always gets the best grades in class. It must have been really difficult. No, it wasn't. I discovered that when I don't attend a class regularly, I put off doing the assignments. I kept putting them off until it was too late to finish. I never thought of you as a procrastinator. You know, I think it had a lot to do with not knowing the professor. I couldn't possibly walk into a classroom unprepared and face a professor, but I never met the online professor and didn't feel the embarrassment of not having my assignments ready. But I think you could manage it because you're motivated. I mean, so you can take that other course next fall. The students discuss two possible solutions to the woman's problem. Describe the problem, then state which of the two solutions you prefer and explain why. Three. Listen to a conversation between two students. I think we should meet early next week to finalize our presentation. What do you think? Yeah, I think you're right. I'm free on Monday at two. Yeah, that's good for me. Do you want me to book a study room at the library again? Hmm, I don't know. It's a nice, quiet place to get work done, but I kind of like to drink coffee while we work. Since they don't allow drinks in the study rooms, what do you think of just meeting at the student union? Um, I think there's something going on at the union Monday afternoon. What was it? Ah, you're right. They're having some sort of book fair. Yeah, that's it. Lots of publishers are going to be setting up displays and everything. I'd really like to go to that. Me too. But what about our project? Monday is really the last day we can work on it before we have to do the presentation. Well, why don't we meet at the book fair and then go to the cafeteria and make the final preparations over a coffee? Don't you think it might be pretty noisy? Nah, I get a lot of studying done in the cafeteria. Yeah, but with the book fair, there'll be lots of extra people milling around. It could be really chaotic. Just getting a coffee might mean spending half our time waiting for the cafeteria lines. I hadn't thought about that. Maybe we should meet in the library. Do you know how much ahead of time we have to reserve a study room? I don't think it matters. You can just walk in, and if one is available at that moment. You can book it right then and there. Well, should we take a risk and not reserve a study room? We could meet in the student union, and if it is too noisy to work in the cafeteria, we could walk over to the library. Sounds good to me. The students are discussing two possible places to meet to finalize their presentation plans. Describe their problem, then state which of the two solutions you prefer and explain why.
4. Listen to a conversation between two students. I hope they drop the physical education course requirements soon so that I don't have to take any of those classes. Do you? Personally, I think the decision's a mistake. Really? Why? I mean. Well, I guess the president's right about some students not wanting to take them, but lots of different studies have shown that being physically fit helps people to concentrate better. But really, students should take on responsibility for their own health, don't you think? I mean, they don't need an authority to force them. They should, but they don't. Students frequently get wrapped up in their studies to the detriment of their physical health. Many I've talked to say that they resent having to sign up for the courses, but when they are in the class, they find it stimulating and a good mental break from sitting in the library. Well, they're probably sports minded. A lot of students, like me for instance, I've never been very good at sports. I absolutely dreaded going to my high school gym class and playing basketball. Well, that's a good point in favor of keeping the physical education courses. Currently, the department's able to offer classes in lots of different sports. The variety of classes offers something for everyone. If the requirements are dropped, those classes will be cut, and that hurts people like you who aren't good at competitive sports like basketball, but who could benefit from something non competitive like aerobics. I must admit that I'm out of shape. But I still don't think it's the university's job to make me fit. But you probably won't take on the responsibility of getting into shape. And think of all the money that's already been spent on sports equipment and facilities. The equipment will go to waste or break and not get replaced. I think this is a very sad commentary on our university's priorities. There's nothing wrong with putting library facilities and labs at the top of the priority list. Well, that's true. But I'm still disappointed in this decision. The man expresses his opinion about the changes in the physical education requirements for students. State his opinion and explain the reasons he gives for that opinion. Five. Listen to part of a lecture in an agriculture class. Since goats can survive on Kinds of vegetation such as bushes and desert scrub, which are unsuitable for other domesticated herd animals, they're a logical means of subsistence for millions of rural inhabitants the world over. They're a valuable resource for milk and meat and can survive where other animals would starve. However, goats have also done considerable damage to delicate ecosystems, particularly. Those areas in danger of turning into deserts.、Uh, the owners of goats have not kept a balance between goat numbers and the available vegetation, and because of that, overgrazing by goats has destroyed areas of bushes, desert scrub, and herbs, as well as woodland in sensitive environments. This animal does not discriminate about where it gets its nourishment and often will eat newly germinated plants, thus preventing the establishment of new vegetation. Also, goats destroy woody plants, in other words, the kind of vegetation whose roots are important for stabilizing the soil. Now, plants need soil to anchor their roots and to provide them with water and nutrients. And the soil needs plants to provide the biological material from which new soil is created. Plants also hold the soil together, stopping it from being driven away by wind and rain. We can say that overgrazing by goats is one of the prime causes of the spread of deserts. Of course, it's not the goat itself that's to blame for the spread of desertification. It's the poor management of the animals that's responsible. What's needed is a large scale educational program on the importance of soil conservation and the spread of techniques for properly managing grazing animals. Using points and examples from the lecture, explain how goats are related to the spread of desertification. Six. 
Listen to part of a lecture in a criminal law class. As you know, the basic principle of the American juvenile justice system is that children are different from adults. And it follows that the way the justice system deals with children should reflect these differences. When the principle was established, It provided for the individualizing of treatment and services to vulnerable children. However, this system is under threat. Critics say it's not tough enough, and also it fails to rehabilitate children. And some of you may agree. After all, criminal statistics point to a steadily increasing problem of youngsters committing crimes. But my concern is that young offenders may start to be treated as adults. Before any reforms are made, a rational examination of the whole system needs to be undertaken. As I see it, there are three key areas of research. The first is accountability. Okay, so, in other words, how are juveniles different from adults in their understanding of criminal behavior? How do we assess their responsibility? Secondly, we need to evaluate risk, risk evaluation. So, this means how can we determine the chances of a given youth committing a crime, and how can we use this information to prevent the crime in the first place? The third area of research is susceptibility. We need to know how susceptible young people are to change. Can we assess a child's or a young person's likelihood of changing behavior or of responding to treatment? So, to repeat, accountability, risk evaluation, and、uh, susceptibility to change. These three key areas of research should be based on a thorough understanding of child and adolescent development. We need experts from all relevant fields, as well as input from the general public. More needs to be learned about the origins, development, prevention, and treatment of juvenile crime. And that knowledge has to be spread among professionals and the community. In this way, eventual reforms of the system may really be able to tackle the growing problem. Using specific information from the lecture, explain the professor's concern about changing the justice system and what needs to be done before reforms are made. Seven. Listen to part of a lecture. In an ecology class. Okay,、uh, today I wanted to talk about intermediate technology, which refers to technology individuals can build using the materials at hand.、Uh, let me give you an example of the importance of this technology. In, in parts of the world, collecting fuel for home use,、uh, fuel such as firewood, dung cake, or agricultural waste. Is not only time-consuming, but the typical patterns of collection lead to problems like deforestation, soil erosion, and ecological imbalances. Experts predict that even if food supplies are adequate for rural populations, fuel supplies for domestic consumption may not be. Considering these problems, aid organizations developed a a solar oven. These ovens are cheaply constructed, easily operated, and extremely energy efficient. The oven consists of an inner and outer metal or cardboard box, a top cover, and two panes of plain glass. The inner box is painted black to absorb solar radiation. The space between the two boxes is filled with a, an easily available insulating material. Such as、uh, rice husks, which, because of their high silicon content, neither attract insects nor rot easily. Other usable materials are、um, ground nutshells or, or coconut shells. Okay, an adjustable mirror is mounted on one side of the oven box, and this mirror reflects the sunlight into the interior of the box. A sufficiently high temperature can be maintained. 
to cook food gradually but thoroughly. Apart from being cheap and energy efficient, the solar oven has other advantages over traditional fires. First, indoor wood fires produce smoke that causes respiratory and, and eye diseases. They're also a fire hazard, especially for small children. Also, the combustion of biofuels produces carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases that contribute to global warming. Okay? So, this intermediate technology, the solar oven, has made a significant improvement in the lives of millions of families in rural societies. Using points and examples from the lecture, explain how the use of intermediate technology is important for rural societies. Eight. Listen to part of a lecture in a world history class. For hundreds of years, the maritime trading city of Venice had controlled the European spice trade with a firm hand. Uh, various spices, including oh, nutmeg, pepper, and cinnamon, were hauled overland across Asia to the great trading market of Constantinople, where they were bought up by Venetian merchants and then uh, shipped westward across the Mediterranean to Venice. Uh, from here, the spices were sold on at mm, often excessive prices to traders from northern Europe. Uh, Venice had an almost complete monopoly of the trade, yet many of the spices originated in countries and regions which few, if any, in Europe had visited. As spices became increasingly popular in medieval Europe, Venice's merchants managed the supply to ensure that high prices were maintained. But in the uh, late 14th and um, early 15th centuries, hundreds of other maritime nations attempted to get a share of the spice trade. Until that time, European ships rarely ventured too far from coastal waters due to the lack of navigation technology and knowledge. But um, gradually, as new methods of navigation were developed, the Spanish and Portuguese learned how to successfully send ships onto the open sea. Uh, Prince Henry of Portugal set out to challenge the Venetians' grip on the spice trade by sending ships around Africa to India and China thus avoiding the overland route. The King of Spain sent ships westward across the Atlantic Ocean in the hope of reaching India from the opposite direction. As is well known, the Italian navigator Christopher Columbus eventually reached the American continent by sailing westward, but didn't find the spice regions of Asia that had been his goal. Uh, within a few years, the Portuguese explorations paid off when the explorer Vasco da Gama reached the west coast of India and returned to Portugal with spices and jewels, as well as the news that the Indians were willing to pursue trade. Using points and examples from the lecture, explain how maritime nations affected the spice trade in Europe. Speaking Section Practice Test 1. Please listen carefully. Some research has indicated that pets are important for a person's mental health. Do you agree or disagree? Explain your point of view. Include details and examples to support your explanation. You may begin to prepare your response after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Two, please listen carefully. If you could donate a large amount of money for scientific or medical research, how would you want the money to be used? Describe one important area in need of more research. 
Explain how your money could make a difference in that field of research. You may begin to prepare your response after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Three, please listen carefully. The student newspaper has published an article about different services offered on campus. Read the description of the legal aid project. You will have 45 seconds to read the description. Begin reading now. Now listen to two students as they discuss the legal aid project. I didn't know that they had a free legal service for students here. You could get help with your housing problem. Oh, I don't know. That project's just set up to help the law students. Mm, maybe, but you said that you couldn't afford to see a lawyer, and this service is free. You might be able to get your rent deposit back. Uh, I don't really trust a student to advise me. I, I mean, those guys don't have any experience, do they? Well, um, I. I think they do. You know, law students have to take a practicum where they deal with real legal cases that were dealt with in the past. Anyway, they go through old cases as if they were current ones, and then they see how the experienced lawyers dealt with the problems and um, you know, analyze the ins and outs of the case. But that's just a classroom exercise. Maybe, but see, it also says that the project staff assists them. The staff probably steps in and gives advice if the student is going in the wrong direction. Now get ready to answer the question. The woman expresses her opinion of the legal aid project. State her opinion and explain her arguments in favor of the service. You may begin to prepare your response after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Four, please listen carefully. Read the passage about the transportation of agricultural goods. You have 45 seconds to read the passage. Begin reading now. Now listen to part of a lecture on this topic in a cultural geography class. Today, I'd like to talk about a German landowner, Johann Heinrich von Thunen, who lived in the 17th century. Uh, after researching ways to make his estate more profitable, von Thunen developed a model of zones uh, represented by concentric rings to explain market forces. In the center is a city. Uh, an imaginary one, to represent the market. As I'm talking about these zones, keep in mind that we're talking about the days before refrigeration, electricity, uh, and so on. Okay, so, the first ring around the city represents the zone that includes dairy farming and such crops as fruit and vegetables. Uh, milk and fresh produce tend to spoil and therefore have to reach the market quickly. Uh, the second ring is the wooded zone used for growing timber. Um, logs are heavy to transport but necessary, both as a fuel and as a building material. Uh, the third ring is the grain zone. A wheat for bread is light and less perishable than fresh produce, so it can be grown further from the market. Uh, next is the livestock zone. Uh, people can walk their cows or sheep to market. The livestock zone is the final one. The area beyond that zone is too far from the center to be considered for commercial farming. Now, interestingly, 
von Thunen's model is still applicable today in terms of transportation costs and the cost of land. Now get ready to answer the question. The professor describes a model of zones relevant for agricultural marketing. Explain how these zones are related to the costs of transportation. You may begin to prepare your response after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Five. Please listen carefully. Listen to a conversation between two students. Hey, you've got your arms full, Ted. Would you like a hand? Nah, I can manage. These are all the books I need for my American short story course. Quite a load, isn't it? Um. Yeah. Well, literature courses always require a lot of books. Yeah, and you know what? I was supposed to buy a lot more books, but I didn't have the money. Oh, textbooks are expensive. Uh, hey, did you stop off at the library first to see if you could get any of the books there? Yeah, but I couldn't find any of the titles on the list. Okay, but um, in literature courses. Usually, you can find the stories you need in different texts. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see your list. Um. Oh, see this book of stories by Edgar Allan Poe. You can probably find all the stories in other books or collections of famous short stories. But how can I be sure? Oh,、uh, did you check the course syllabus? I bet the professor has stated exactly what stories you need to read before the class meeting. And、um, you can look for them in other books. Do you have the course syllabus? Yeah, right here. See. Okay. Well, see, you need to read Chrysanthemums by John Steinbeck. That definitely should be in the library in a book of short stories. Did you look? Well,、uh, no, I didn't look for individual stories. Well,、uh, I suggest you keep the receipts for all of these books. And then search for the exact stories you need in the library. I'm sure you'll find a lot of them there. Then you can take the books you don't need back to the bookstore. Yeah, I could do that. But you know, I like to own my books, highlight passages, and scribble notes in the margins and whatnot. Oh well. Oh, hey, here's another thing you could do. Those books look new. Did you go to the used bookstore first? Used bookstore? Yeah. There's a used bookstore on、um, University Avenue. They buy used textbooks at the end of the semester. If that professor has been requiring that the students read the same books every semester, chances are that you'll find them there, and、um, that way you'll have your own copy and you won't be paying so much. Now get ready to answer the question. The woman has two suggestions for the men. Describe the man's problem, then state which of the two suggestions you prefer and explain why. You may begin to prepare your response after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Six. Please listen carefully. Listen to part of a lecture in a music education class. I'm sure you've heard of the Mozart effect, a term coined to refer to the results of a neuroscience music brain experiment. In this experiment. Researchers were looking at one specific area of the brain, where the ability to think in terms of space and time, or spatial-temporal reasoning, takes place. 
This kind of reasoning is important in music, but not all aspects of music. And it's important in solving some types of physics and mathematics problems. Uh, some types. The researchers chose Mozart's music because, as a child prodigy, he used space-time reasoning at an early age. I'm uncertain of the relationship between a child composer's use of this reasoning to create a masterpiece and an adult listener's use when hearing it. Anyway, the experimental group, college students, not children, were given a pretest just in their spatial-temporal reasoning. Then they were divided into three groups. One heard no music, one a variety of different kinds of music, and one group only heard Mozart. Afterwards, all the subjects took an intelligence test. The results? Well, the Mozart group had increased scores on the spatial-temporal reasoning section. The increase lasted for ten minutes. Only ten minutes. Now, there are several types of intelligence tests that could have been used, but only one type was used in the experiment. One wonders if a different IQ test would have had the same results. The study was interesting, but I'm concerned about the reaction of the general public. The media interest and the belief that listening to Mozart's music can increase one's intelligence was followed by Help Your Child Be a Genius books popular magazine articles, and the flourishing market of videos, toys, and music products, all aimed at gullible parents. This is unfortunate, because the real importance of music, that of bringing beauty into our lives, is being undermined by parents foolishly attempting to turn their children into rocket scientists. Now get ready to answer the question. Using points and examples from the lecture, explain how the experiment does not support the public's belief in the Mozart effect. You may begin to prepare your response after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Part 2. Building Skills Writing Exercise W35 Writing Summaries of Listening Passages 1. A feature seen in many cities around the world is the shantytown. This is an illegal settlement built on disused city land. The people living in these settlements usually have immigrated to the city from rural areas in hopes of finding jobs. Arriving without enough money to rent housing, they collect scrap materials to build makeshift shelters. The shantytown often lacks public facilities such as water supplies, drainage systems, and electricity. However, in time, these facilities may be added and homes improved until the shantytown becomes a more permanent settlement. Two. Astronomers have observed structures of glowing blue arcs of light nearly two million trillion miles in length. These arcs are thought to be optical illusions created by light that has been bent due to the immense gravitational pull of a massive galaxy. The arcs are probably formed when the light from a distant galaxy is bent by the gravitational pull of another, less distant, intervening galaxy. Even though such light-bending galaxies contain billions of stars, they still don't contain enough visible stars to exert the pull needed to bend light in this way. Therefore, huge amounts of invisible or dark matter must exist within these galaxies. Three. The Henry Ford Museum was founded in 1929 in Dearborn, Michigan, about 12 miles west of downtown Detroit. 
This museum has redesigned its display of old cars to show the changes brought about by the automobile. One exhibit, which shows the evolution of roadside services, contrasts a 1940s diner with a 1960s fast food restaurant. The Getting Away From It All exhibit presents an assortment of recreational vehicles dating from a 1916 camper truck to today's mobile home. Changes in roadside objects, such as billboards, can be seen along the museum's roadway, where 108 cars are lined up as if traveling. For the car enthusiast, this museum should not be overlooked. Exercise W36 Revising Summaries of Listening Passages 1. The advantages of herding animals over hunting them are numerous. The most obvious advantage is not having to search for food as the herded animals can provide both milk and meat. Instead of having fresh meat only after the hunt, there's the convenience of keeping the herd animal alive until the meat is needed. 2. Every year, game manufacturers introduce many new games to the consuming public. These are designed to entertain millions of fun seekers who like to roll the dice, pick a card, guess a quote, or buy property depending on the game of their choice. Very popular on the market are the ones that test a player's general knowledge. We shouldn't dismiss these games that puzzle, preoccupy, and, uh, frustrate us as mere entertainment because research is showing that keeping one's mind active is one of the ways to maintain one's thinking capacity into the later years of life. 3. One type of structure of the Anasazi people of the southwestern United States that I'd like to discuss today is called a kiva. The kiva is considered to have had a mainly religious and ceremonial purpose. One type of kiva is circular in shape, with six stone pillars built into the wall. These pillars were used to support the roof beams. A, a fire pit in the, in the center of the room has a short wall behind it. The wall served as a deflector for the air intake. Another feature of the kiva is a small round hole in the floor, which was regarded as a, a symbolic entrance to the underworld. Exercise W38. Summarizing Listening Passages. 1. Now listen to part of a lecture. During the Depression era in the United States, President Roosevelt's administration started innovative and often controversial cultural programs to ease unemployment among artists and writers, while at the same time give the general public access to the arts. One scheme funded under the Federal Writers Project employed nearly 7,000 writers at its peak in 1936. The funding provided work for both novice and experienced writers, many of whom went on to acquire literary reputations. Writers interviewed over 10,000 people from different regions, ethnic groups, and occupations about major areas of their life. The wide diversity was encouraged by the administrators, keen to foster tolerance and promote a sense of national identity during the difficult period of the 1930s. People interviewed included those from all walks of life, business executives to vagrants. Many interviewees told of their upbringing in the 19th century and included recollections of historic people or important events. Included among the informants were a large number of former slaves whose memories offer a vivid account of conditions before and after the abolition of slavery. These vivid and often sad accounts of life histories 
were originally intended for publication in a series that would form a documentary portrait of everyday life in America. Unfortunately, the project was never fully realized, partially due to the redirection of national priorities with the United States entering World War II. However, the raw material collected remains a valuable resource for historians and provides insight into the lives of ordinary people of a bygone era. Furthermore, several of the project writers found that the knowledge and experiences they had gathered from their research was an invaluable source for their own literary creations. Two. Now listen to part of a lecture. You may be interested to know that the first test scoring machines were developed in the 1930s. The earliest prototype was created by Reynold B. Johnson, a high school teacher from Michigan. Uh, his invention was based on the fact that graphite conducts electricity. His inspiration to use graphite came to him when he was recalling one of the boyhood tricks that he played on his sister's friends. <laughs> he would scratch pencil marks on the spark plugs of their parked cars. Then, when the drivers tried to start their cars, the graphite in the pencil marks would draw the sparks away from the spark plugs, and the engines wouldn't start. Thinking about this prank, Johnson realized that a, a machine could electrically sense pencil marks made on a sheet of paper and then indicate if these marks were in the right places. By 1933, Johnson had made a working model of a test-scoring machine. One day, he received a telegram from an executive at the IBM company. Uh, their company had, had been trying to produce a test-scoring machine for several years and, and wanted to purchase Johnson's invention. After a few setbacks and interventions within the IBM management, Johnson's machine finally met approval and was improved over the next few years. This machine allowed a large number of exams to be scored efficiently and with no human error. This led to the feasibility of widespread standardized testing. Nowadays, computerized exams are gradually taking over the role of machine-scored standardized exams. It's likely that the scoring machine will remain around for some time to come before completely being replaced by the computer. Exercise W39 Linking Ideas in Reading and Listening Passages 1. Now listen to part of a lecture on the topic you just read about. A lot of evidence seems to underline the need for a more cautious approach to fluoride supplementation. First of all, when we add fluoride to the water supply, we're doing so without the informed consent of the public. Uh, now, you could argue that since the benefits are so obvious to the consumer that no consent is necessary. But several studies have shown that fluoride supplementation may be more hazardous than was once thought. Uh, if that's true, then the act of adding fluoride is a, uh, a kind of large-scale experiment in which the subjects, that is, uh, the general public, have not given their consent to be treated as guinea pigs. Think about it. Would you allow doctors to test medications on you without your knowledge and consent? In fact, at least one large-scale study carried out recently concluded that average decay rates for children in both fluoridated and non-fluoridated areas were almost identical. Um, besides this... Evidence seems to be coming in that uh, decay rates are going down in most places for other reasons, uh, unconnected with the use of fluoride. Uh, beyond this, some research has called into question the safety of the supplements. Environmentalists, for example, claim that the supplements are not the same as naturally occurring fluoride since it's derived from a hazardous waste and contains toxic pollutants. 
Um, furthermore, several side effects have been reported from the overexposure to fluoride in animal testing. Remember that fluoride is a cumulative poison. Only a percentage leaves the body and the remainder accumulates in different tissues. This can lead to uh, unforeseen health problems. All in all, it seems clear that much more public debate and research into the benefits and potential dangers caused by fluoride supplementation needs to be conducted. Two. Now listen to part of a lecture on the topic you just read about. Well, the belief in the value of using animals as predictors of earthquakes is, in my opinion, based on very weak evidence. Um, the fact is that no serious scientific research has shown that this actually works. I agree, of course, that animals have been shown to have different and often superior sensory capacities. But all the evidence we've collected about animal behavior prior to earthquakes is anecdotal. Uh, in other words, based on what people claim to have observed after the event. So, often after any sudden major event, people focus on things they remember happening just before. Amongst other things, they remember things like animals apparently behaving oddly. It may be that animals from time to time behave in unusual ways, but if this isn't followed by an impressive event, such as an earthquake, well, then people have no reason to remember this behavior. People often remember vividly all kinds of things that happened prior to any surprising or catastrophic event. Um, some studies have shown some of the animal stories to be fanciful rather than factual. Oh, for example, people have often claimed that many dogs and other family pets go missing just before a quake. The hypothesis that this could be caused by the animal's anticipation of an earthquake has in fact been tested in California by scientists who have studied reports of missing animals in conjunction with earthquake activity. This study, at least, showed no connection between pet behavior and quake occurrence over a three-year period. As for the often-heard success of the evacuation of a Chinese city prior to an earthquake based on animal behavior, it turns out that, in fact, the real warning was given by a series of four shocks, shocks that sometimes occur before a major quake. Exercise W44. Practice responding to the integrated writing task. 1. Now listen to part of a lecture on the topic you just read about. Being able to communicate using language is one of our human species' most important abilities. Some scientists claim that apes, like humans, also use languages. There are many studies into ape acquisition of language, some famous, such as the Coco studies. But are these animals really acquiring language? We really haven't done enough research to address the question of how and when humans started using language, but we can compare human and ape communicative abilities to determine whether the claims about ape language are valid. First, for behavior to be called language, it must be communicative. In other words, the signers must be able to use language creatively. They should be able to take turns in conversation must sign spontaneously rather than as a response to drilling or coercion, and must be able to comment on interesting phenomena. If you think about what the apes have accomplished in communicating, these criteria have not been met. However, according to the proponents of ape communication, the animals do meet these criteria. They maintain that those of us who question the validity of this research have never worked with apes. However, we wonder how much influence their probable emotional attachment to an animal has on the conclusions they reach. Is there a solution in sight that would put an end to this controversy? Yes, there might be. 
Studies are being undertaken at the neurophysiological level. Through the use of modern brain scanning techniques, such as MRI, we may be able to get a better picture of the brain activity of a healthy human during communication and an ape while supposedly communicating. A comparison of these scans should give us an insight into whether apes really do communicate. Summarize the points made in the lecture you just heard, explaining how they cast doubt on the points made in the reading. Two. Now listen to part of a lecture on the topic you just read about. Okay, the question of why the current is so important to the young salmon was asked, and I'd like to respond to this. Smolts, uh, the young salmon, hatch from their eggs in fresh water. Before the large-scale construction of dams, the young fish use the strong current from the spring runoff of、um, melting snow. To get to the sea in between six and twenty、uh, days, it's necessary for them to reach the sea within this window of time because、uh, during these days the smolts' bodies undergo the physiological changes for adaptation to salt water. The net result of the slow current is that many of the young fish don't survive the trip, which can now take up to whoa. Sixty days to reach the sea. What happens is their bodies have adapted to salt water conditions, but they're still in fresh water. Obviously, with fewer fish surviving the trip to the sea, there are fewer adult salmon to migrate back up the rivers for breeding. Ah,、uh, the solutions to the problem that have been presented have not been very successful. Um, many scientists think that the artificial method of getting the fish to the sea by barge has killed more fish than it saves. The suggestions some people have made concerning increasing the flow rate temporarily by、uh, either releasing water from upstream reservoirs or、uh, reducing the water level in all linked reservoirs for the period of smolt migration would be a、uh, A partial solution to the declining salmon numbers. Unfortunately, both of these proposals have met with criticism from the power companies that manage the dams. Summarize the points made in the lecture you just heard, explaining how they support the points made in the reading. Three. Now listen to part of a lecture on the topic you just read about. Okay, so you all know something about DDT and its、uh, apparent environmental risks, but these risks are not necessarily valid.、Uh, the evidence that DDT led to population declines of various birds of prey, the bald eagle, for instance, has come under criticism. Apparently, the bald eagle populations were in decline well before the widespread use of DDT. On, on the contrary, in 1960, that's about 15 years after the introduction of DDT, observers were reporting a rise in bald eagle numbers. Similar results have been found among other high food chain birds. Brown pelicans, for example, reached their lowest number before the introduction of DDT. The fact is, they were hunted to near extinction. I've found studies showing that this bird, as well as the peregrine falcon, actually experienced no difficulty in reproducing during the DDT years. So, what about the evidence that DDT led to eggshell thinning? Unfortunately, the experiments associating DDT with this phenomenon involved doses massively higher than could ever be encountered in the wild. Even then, the degree of thinning was less than that found in eggs in the wild. In other words, the evidence shows that eggshell thinning and DDT are not correlated. However, other substances are, for example, oil spills,、uh, lead and mercury poisoning, and other factors such as stress from noise, fear, or excitement may be tied to the eggshell thinning. Even the human cancer scare seems to have been exaggerated. 
Uh, again, several studies show that there may be no link between DDT and cancer at all. Research into DDT as a pesticide has indicated that overuse of the pesticide can result in its loss of effectiveness against insect-borne diseases. But responsible use is an effective method of fighting the spread of malaria, and its reintroduction should be seriously reconsidered. Summarize the points made in the lecture you just heard, explaining how they cast doubt on the points made in the reading. Writing Section Practice Test Now listen to part of a lecture on the topic you just read about. Okay, now I want to discuss tidal power. Since I think it's a good example of an alternative energy source that we should look at critically. Okay, now let's think about some of the possible drawbacks to the system. For a start, a tidal power can never do more than provide a fraction of our total energy needs since there just aren't enough good locations. However, a tidal power could still make some contribution at a regional level. But what about the environmental impact? First of all, the quality of the water in the estuary area will be changed. And this will have an effect, of course, on the local wildlife. Both the increase in salinity when seawater is mixed with estuary water and also the amount of mud and sediments churned up in the water will affect the birds and the fish. These conditions could stimulate the growth of the red tide organism, which, which causes paralysis in shellfish and, and affects many aquatic creatures. And much of the intertidal habitat could be destroyed, and this would have a devastating effect on birds and vegetation types adapted to these conditions. And what about the fish that naturally migrate between river and sea? Now, their ability to migrate will be hampered, since they won't be able to pass the barrage. Now, it it could be possible to make some kind of provision for them to move freely between salt and freshwater environments, but this would lead to expensive design considerations. Also, there are implications for the people living in the area. For example, fishing boats are normally moored in the estuary for protection from the rougher waters, but they'll no longer be able to navigate between estuary and open sea. In such a case, the economy of the whole area could be affected. So all of these things are drawbacks of tidal power and need to be matched against the benefits of alternative energy production. Summarize the points made in the lecture you just heard, explaining how they cast doubt on the points made in the reading. The program continues on the next CD.